Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today, we're talking remotely once again with Matthew DePaola. Dr. DePaola is an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Wright State in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, Dr. DePaola specializes in shoulder and elbow surgery. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. DePaola. Thanks for having me again, Randall. Well, Dr. DePaola, in our last discussion, we talked a bit about um, the diagnosis and, and the, the early treatment of uh, massive rotator cuff tears. And for the viewers that haven't reviewed that uh, video, I would highly recommend that you go back and, and take a look at that because in that video, we really discussed a lot of the basics on how rotator cuff tears occur and how they're evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon such as yourself. In this discussion, I would hope that we would shift to the treatment of massive rotator cuff tears. So let's start out by uh, briefly describing for, for the patients that are watching how you approach that discussion with the patient when you first see the patient and decide it's time to talk about how we're going to treat this injury. Well, if you have a massive rotator cuff tear, you've uh, indicated that you have a very large tear, multiple tendons involved. And the first objective when talking with a patient with this diagnosis is to get an idea of their goals for their shoulder. So each treatment should be individualized for a particular patient. In other words, a baseball player or a young uh, individual who uses their arm for a very physical occupation is going to need uh, far different things out of their shoulder than an older uh, patient who is not very active. So that's the first step is to understand and we do that by having a conversation to figure out what their goals are and then we tailor the particular options from there. Well, and when you begin to look at, at the different options uh, of, of surgery for this condition, uh, what do you think those options are? There's multiple options for massive rotator cuff tears and they depend on a few things. They depend first on the goals of the patient. They then depend on the timing uh, at which that patient comes to us. So how old the particular tear is that they have when they actually see us. And then they may also depend on the uh, quality of the tissue or the size of the tear as well, which is something you really can only get a feel for after further imaging, uh, physical exam, and maybe even examination in the operating room. So when you begin your discussion with these patients and, and you're talking about perhaps continuing conservative care, what are the options there? Are, are you a believer that injections in the shoulder have a role? Do you feel like that physical therapy continues to have a role in conservative therapy? I think there's a role for conservative therapy in uh, a lot of patients. Um, the patient who uh, comes to me um, with a very gradual onset of pain, um, maybe who has not had a sudden injury, someone who's just gradually built up and slowly come to the realization that they have a massive rotator cuff tear, is definitely a good candidate for conservative treatments such as physical therapy and injections because that's an indication um, that the tear may have been going on for a long time. Um, another indication that that tear might be uh, old or that have been going on for a long time is imaging studies that show um, atrophy or muscle wasting. Um, those individuals, you can probably move along the course of treatment in a more gradual uh, time frame than someone who comes to you who may have had an acute injury such as uh, falling on the ice or slipping off of a ladder. Those I think are different patients. The patient who has a new injury, an acute injury, um, I tend to be a little more aggressive in terms of how I counsel them because we know from some new studies that the earlier you get to these tears, acute tears in particular, the oftentimes better uh, they do in terms of, of getting a surgery. So oftentimes patients will come to me having had all of these treatments, having had physical therapy, having had injections, and maybe multiple rounds of those. And if you're coming um, after that and those things aren't working, I think that's a time to discuss 
um, surgical options, or in the second case, when you have an acute injury, that's a time where you may want to bring that discussion up sooner rather than later. And, and let's talk a little bit about that conservative therapy. You know, I think a, a lot of patients have been sent to physical therapy. A lot of patients may have received injections in their shoulder. Try to explain a little bit for patients that are listening what your goals are as the orthopedic surgeon, what you're trying to accomplish with those two things. So let's start with the injections. What are you injecting and, and what are you trying to accomplish with that injection? Injections often um, contain a cortisone type medication. So it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory that's delivered to the actual site of the uh, pain. And they have multiple uh, names, but they're basically in the uh, anti-inflammatory family. Um, we also usually inject a uh, shorter acting anesthetic, similar to Novocaine, we call them Marcaine or Lidocaine. Um, any of those uh, work relatively well, and that actually gives an, more of an immediate effect. My general philosophy with injections is that they are uh, in addition to physical therapy, and they should be used to help a patient uh, perhaps get started in a more comfortable manner into a therapy program. Um, I tend to counsel patients that injections are temporary in nature, that they shouldn't be taken as the only treatment for um, shoulder pain. Um, and, and I think if you go in with that, that attitude that, that the injection will cure this, that you might be disappointed. So I, I counsel patients that we're going to use the injection to relieve some of the uh, initial inflammation to help you get started with your therapy program. Well, and let's talk a little bit about therapy. When, when you send a patient to physical therapy or assign them a set of exercises that they should be doing, what are you hoping to accomplish when, when in fact, they may have a rotator cuff tear um, and you're having them begin to move uh, and do these exercises with the shoulder that's actually damaged? So what, what, are, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, I want to accomplish a few goals when I prescribe physical therapy. Uh, perhaps number one is pain relief. Um, and number two that goes along with that is um, range of motion or increase in range of motion. The two um, uh, factors of pain relief and uh, range of motion oftentimes go together. So if your range of motion is diminished, oftentimes you're in significant pain. So generally, if you can uh, loosen the shoulder up and bring it back to more of a, a normal range of motion, you'll help alleviate a lot of the pain that patients are having. So those are uh, my two main goals. In addition to that, um, my goal would be to re-strengthen the muscles around the shoulder. So we're talking today about massive rotator cuff tears. And in our last video, we talked about how in a massive rotator cuff tear, you actually have disconnected the tendons that help power your uh, shoulder joint from the, from the bones themselves. So you're going to have a certain amount of weakness in those particular ranges of motion that the rotator cuff muscles control, but the shoulder is extraordinarily complex, and there are groups of muscles around the shoulder blade, around the front of the shoulder, and around the top of the shoulder that can help compensate for a loss of those muscles. Yeah, I think that's an important point, and I'm glad you brought that out. You know, I, I think a lot of patients sort of assume that if something's broke, our job is to fix it as orthopedic surgeons. So if you've got a massive rotator cuff tear, then a lot of patients are going to ask, well, why don't you just fix this? Why are you trying to, to you know, use conservative therapy if it's fixed? Aren't you, or if it's torn, aren't you eventually going to have to go in and fix it? And I think your, your answer is that maybe not. Um, we can still increase function. We can still give you a good, solid shoulder that can do what you, what you want to do with it if, if the risk of surgery is, is higher than the normal population or too high to consider surgery, I think patients should understand that one option in a lot of cases is to increase the function with physical therapy and maybe some symptomatic, symptomatic uh, control and maybe not jump right into fixing a rotator cuff tear or doing something surgical. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that, that up. Let's talk a little bit now about surgical options. Um, 
once you sit down and, and sort of you and the patient decide that surgery is, is probably going to be at least one option and possibly the best option on the table, what, what sort of choices uh, from a surgical standpoint do patients have in terms of repairing or doing something to the shoulder surgically that actually improves function? The choices for massive rotator cuff tears really depend on the factors we had talked about earlier. Um, one of the biggest factors is the timing at which you come and see me after having had the tear. So let's take the example of a patient who fell off a ladder two weeks ago, has had extraordinarily bad shoulder pain, uh, maybe inability to raise the arm, weakness, and he comes in to see me. Uh, that's a very different patient than the patient who's had gradual onset of shoulder pain for perhaps four years, very different. So the first patient, um, I would first again assess their goals, talk to them about what they want out of their shoulder, what their occupation is, how much they need the shoulder um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, their goals in terms of lifting the, their arm overhead, and then talk to them about their general medical health. Are they a candidate for surgery? Uh, some people really aren't good candidates for surgery period, for an elective surgery because of other health problems. And that's one of the most important things to talk about with the patient because we shouldn't even go down that road with that discussion if you're not a good candidate. But let's say you are, if you are a good candidate, um, there are multiple options uh, for uh, these particular patients. In the case of an acute tear, my goal is to do everything I can to repair the tendon back to the bone uh, where it was, where the anatomy wants to be. Um, there's a few techniques to do this, and I think the, the broad categories for these are arthroscopic techniques and open techniques. Now, traditionally, open techniques um, were used to repair tendon directly back to bone, and that would mean making an incision at the top of the shoulder and dissecting through the large muscle called the deltoid. Now with some of these repairs, you have to detach part of the deltoid from the shoulder blade and then reattach it after you were done. And I think that was recognized as one of the main drawbacks of this particular type of surgery um, because that left open the possibility of that repair failing. Um, now gradually over the past few decades, we've developed arthroscopic techniques. And um, with arthroscopic techniques, you basically use small incisions and instruments the size of a pen or pencil um, to repair the tendon without uh, having to release that large deltoid muscle. And these techniques have become more and more promising over the years and more and more refined. And an analogy I like to use with patients is it's like building a ship in a bottle. So we have very specialized instruments that are able to per perform all of the same procedures we did before with large open incisions, and we're able to use the small camera to first look inside and gauge how good the tendon is and uh, the repairability of the tendon, and then oftentimes repair the entire tear um, through the arthroscopic means. Um, one caveat with this type of repair is that um, it's important to have a surgeon who's skilled in this particular, um, uh, these particular techniques because it is very technically demanding. And what, what is your take on, on arthroscopic versus open? Do you see any big differences in terms of outcomes? And, and what are the advantages of arthroscopic uh, repair over the more traditional uh, larger incisions? Each tear is different, however, and uh, it's up to the surgeon to, to, to decide um, within their skill, skill level and based on the characteristics of the particular tear, which technique to apply. Um, so I think there's a great deal of promise with arthroscopic techniques. We, the, one of the main advantages, um, as we had mentioned earlier, is that you don't have to uh, detach the deltoid muscle from the shoulder blade and um, that provides less morbidity in this particular procedure. In addition, I think you get very good visualization of the entire uh, shoulder joint, which sometimes there's uh, 
pathology in the joint that goes along with the rotator cuff tear that you may want to address at the same time, which is can be a little more difficult um, with the open techniques without more extensive dissection. Yeah, you know, I think I think again, you bring up a very interesting point, and that that is that you know, as as surgery has moved to more and more minimally invasive techniques to try to accomplish the same thing, the key point in that move is that traditionally surgery involves damaging a lot of normal tissue in order to actually get to a position to where you can see the problem. And, you know, it's always been for surgeons sort of the holy grail to be able to fix the problem and not do any additional damage. So not damage, for example, in the shoulder, the deltoid. So I think we're really sort of continuing down that path to try to minimize our effect on normal tissue and not have to uh, have the rehab also include allowing normal tissue to heal before you can begin a, a program of rehab, uh, and and arthroscopic shoulder surgery is one of the one of the the key uh, examples of that. I guess you would say trying to get through the outer covering of the shoulder, the the large deltoid muscle, without creating another potential problem. So I'm glad to see that that these. Uh, uh, studies are now showing what I think most of us always thought that if we could somehow accomplish uh, a, a repair on the damaged tissue without damaging normal tissue, uh, you know, it's just intuitive that the results would ultimately be better. So I'm glad to see that the literature is is now supporting that and try, and trying to prove that 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 is in fact the case. Let's move on and talk a little bit about surgery that maybe. Um, fails from the standpoint of, of you get into a shoulder and you realize that the tear is too massive and you can't do what you've just described and that is fix the rotator cuff tendons back to where they should be. What are your options at that point? Well, let's talk about why you might not be able to fix a tendon. Um, size in and of itself is usually not a reason uh, where you should say, I can't fix this. However, quality of the tendon tissue, the amount of scarring present, and perhaps um, other pathology at the same time, such as arthritis, those may be reasons where you say, this is not a rotator cuff tear that I can or should fix. So we know from uh, past literature that the larger the tendon tear, the higher proclivity, proclivity it has to want to re-tear um, after having fixed it. We know that. And that's why we're beginning to uh, talk more about timing of these, these tears because we know that the, the muscles themselves tend to act like, like springs to pull the tendon back to a point where it wants to scar and becomes much more difficult to address. So when I go into a shoulder, the first thing I'm, I'm looking at is, um, is this tissue compliant? Is this tissue um, uh, mobile? And if it's not, then I'm going to use various strategies to try and uh, mobilize that tissue to move it. And some of those involve releasing uh, scar tissue um, and um, potentially doing other techniques such as traction uh, to bring it back to a more anatomic position. Um, Say, for instance, we can't, though. We, we get into the shoulder. We've tried every technique we have in our toolbox. Uh, the tissue is just poor quality. We've put sutures in it. It's not holding it. Uh, some people like to describe it like putting sutures through Kleenex. Uh, what then? Um, well, we do have some options. And I will always talk to patients before the operation about this because sometimes you get a good feel of this based on what you see in the MRI. And sometimes you don't. Sometimes the MRIs look okay, but you've tried everything and this tendon is just too scarred. So one of your options is what we would call a debridement. And a debridement is basically when you go in with the arthroscopic instruments, uh, shavers or burrs, and you uh, clean up, so to speak, or you uh, remove some of the frayed edges of tissue and uh, inflamed tissue. That's one option. Um, sometimes along with that, if it's a long-standing tear and you have a patient with uh, grinding type symptoms where the ball is, is riding up high against the undersurface of the shoulder blade, you may be able to smooth the surfaces out with a burr. Uh, 
And that's a uh, procedure that was developed by one of my mentors, John Fenlon, um, that is called a tuberoplasty. Um, and that's been shown to provide good relief. Um, a few other options include addressing the biceps tendon. Sometimes when you have a massive tear that is not fixable, um, but your biceps tendon is intact, you can oftentimes release the, the biceps tendon where it inserts at the top of the socket. And that's been shown by some authors to provide good relief as well. Um, another option is, is sort of the in-between option, and that is a partial uh, repair of a large or massive rotator cuff. And what that usually involves is the mobilization techniques, so scar release and traction. Um, and what you find is that you can't fully bring the tendon back to the bone. However, sometimes you're able to close down um, a hole um, to make it a smaller uh, uh, tendon tear. And depending on where the tendon tear is in the shoulder, um, that has been found to be effective in some people for uh, rebalancing the shoulder, so to speak, and keeping the ball centered in the socket, which we know is one of the main uh, functions of the rotator cuff. Um, how do you have that discussion after surgery with the patients? I mean, what do you try to sort of focus on in, in terms of what you've accomplished in that shoulder if you haven't been able to repair the, uh, the, the, the rotator cuff tendons? What do you sort of focus their activities on at that point? Um, well, I, I first like to have a discussion before surgery about what the potential options are going to be. I, I think uh, the discussion is best had at that point because with any cuff tear, there is a, a potential chance that you can't fix it. So I think if you lay that, um, if you lay those particular options out ahead of time, um, it eases the patient into a better understanding of, of what you're doing and what the potential prognosis is. But say we get to that point and we've gone into the operating room and we've got a tendon that we can't fix for some reason. Um, depending on what we did, um, we will then tailor the uh, particular rehabilitation protocol and maybe the expectations of uh, what they're going to get out of that shoulder. Now, if we did a partial uh, rotator cuff repair, I'm going to treat those patients from a rehabilitation standpoint more similar to how I would treat a uh, rotator cuff repair because there is an element of tissue healing that is going on at that point. Um, if we do a, a simple debridement or a biceps tenotomy without repair, then I'm going to allow those patients to move the shoulder um, quicker um, and get back to their activities of daily living without as many restrictions early on because, uh, frankly, I'm not worried about the rotator cuff uh, tendon tissue healing uh, because we haven't been able to repair it. So in some senses, they can actually get moving faster um, if, they, if we have not repaired the tissue to bone uh, than in a case when we do. Well, I guess we, we probably ought to ask the question at this point, what if this fails? I mean, what if, if maybe this lasts for a year and all of a sudden the, the shoulder pain gets worse, the pain uh, is intolerable, and, and perhaps the patient comes back you know, a year later, two years later, maybe several years later, and you haven't been able to repair the rotator cuff, some time has gone on, additional degeneration has gone on, but, but again, the situation is now once again intolerable for the patient. What's the option at that point? Well, I always tell people you always have options. And the options uh, basically break down into two basic categories. And those categories are conservative treatments, um, such as physical therapy and injections, or oral pain medications. And the second option being surgery. Now, the conservative measures, um, if you have a failed cuff repair, um, I think injections are a very good option for you. Um, one of the main issues with doing too many injections on a patient is that the injection itself can be somewhat detrimental to the rotator cuff. Uh, in other words, if you get too many, it can damage your, your cuff tendon. And that's why you'll oftentimes hear uh, doctors counsel patients that you can only have one every few months. Now, in the case where your rotator cuff is torn beyond repair, then you really don't have that problem to worry about. So it frees you up to be a little more liberal, I think, with the injections. But say you can't tolerate that and that's just not working for you. Um, there are other surgical options beyond repair, beyond debridement. Uh, 
but it's very dependent on what type of patient you are. Are you a young patient? Are you an older patient? Do you have arthritis at the same time? So let's talk about the young patient who has a failed rotator cuff repair. There's a certain subgroup of these patients who may be a candidate for what we call a tendon transfer. So that means taking a muscle from one area of the body and moving it to compensate for lost tendon or lost muscle in another area. So there's two main types of transfers in, in the shoulder uh, for rotator cuff uh, tears. Uh, one being a pectoralis transfer, so that's your, your pec muscle in the front of your shoulder, and that can sometimes compensate for loss of the uh, large subscapularis muscle. And then there's what we call a latissimus transfer, which is a muscle that usually comes from your back, and that's if you have a large or massive uh, irreparable cuff tear um, on the upper rotator cuff tendons, which are the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, or teres minor. That's what we call a superior posterior uh, tear. Now, you have to be a special type of patient to undergo this type of surgery. Number one, you have to be young. Number two, the, the um, ball has to be well-centered in the socket, and that's something you check by x-rays. Um, and number three, it helps if you can already elevate the shoulder above shoulder level. If you don't meet those criteria, then you're likely not a good candidate for the latissimus transfer, and that's why it's a pretty rare procedure and we don't often use it. So let's talk a little bit about if you're an older patient, say you're in your 70s and you've got a massive rotator cuff tear and you've tried a lot of options such as surgery and it's still bothering you and it's not working. There are some people who are now using a prosthesis called the reverse total shoulder prosthesis for this particular problem. And there's some early studies showing that it works relatively well. However, I think we, we have to uh, have a little bit of caution with this because this shoulder replacement procedure is not for younger patients, number one. Um, it does um, often degrade in terms of its results. The results get worse over time as the longer you have it in. So it really is better as what we would call a salvage um, type procedure only. And it's still early on in the use here in the United States. It's only been approved uh, within the last decade, so we're still learning a lot about it. Um, but that's an option for someone with very disabling uh, pain um, and, and perhaps what we call a uh, uh, pseudo paralysis of the shoulder. Well, when, you, when you're looking at the possibility of a, of a reverse rotator or a reverse shoulder replacement, are you just going after pain relief or do you see that the patients who have this procedure actually improve their function with the shoulder? It makes it stronger or, or are they able to move the shoulder in a more functional manner? Well, the reverse total shoulder is almost a discussion in and of itself. Um, it was a shoulder replacement that was designed originally for a special problem um, called rotator cuff arthropathy. So it's a problem with two components. One is a irreparable cuff tear, and the second is arthritis. It's really a special case of arthritis or a special case of cuff tear. So that's who it was originally made for. It was originally designed um, in France, and it's been used there longer in Europe, longer than in the United States. What you are doing with that particular shoulder replacement is you're putting a certain amount of constraint to the shoulder. So typically your rotator cuff helps keep the ball centered in the socket. When you're missing that tendon up, up top especially, the ball can ride up underneath the shoulder blade and bump against the, the undersurface of the shoulder blade. If you put in a regular shoulder replacement in that particular case, then over time the socket portion of the shoulder replacement will loosen. And we've learned that because people have done it, they've tried it and they failed. So that is the, uh, the best uh, circumstance in which you want to use that particular prosthesis. That's, that, that's the problem you're trying to solve. What you're doing with that prosthesis is actually substituting a different muscle, the deltoid muscle, to help elevate your, your shoulder as opposed to the rotator cuff muscles which are missing. So the goal is both pain relief and 
increase in function, although I tend to emphasize the pain relief when counseling patients because it's hard to guarantee functional results. Um, usually, if you can get to at least 90 degrees of motion, which is about here, of forward flexion, after that particular type of shoulder replacement, that's a pretty good result because it's, like we said, a what we call a salvage prosthesis or an end-of-the-line type prosthesis. Well, if I can paraphrase what we've discussed during this discussion today, uh, we started out talking about you know, conservative care for a rotator cuff tear and what you can expect from that. We talked a little bit about repair and the, and the options for repair of the rotator cuff, which you know, if you can accomplish that, seems like the, the, the best option for most people. But we also talked a bit about the, the fact that some people can't get a, a stable cuff repair and are going to have to look at other options. And I think we went back and talked a bit about, you know, conservative care therapy again in terms of how we're managing those patients. We talked a little bit about the fairly rare need for uh, transfers of different muscles and tendons to, to in some ways take the place of the rotator cuff tear. And now we've talked a little bit about the, the, the fact that you can have options at the end stage is the salvage procedure where you can actually replace the shoulder and try to obtain some pain relief if, if not obtain increased function. Is there anything else that patients need to understand that are options for treatment of massive rotator cuff tears that, that we haven't discussed to this point? Well, I think it's just really important to emphasize that every shoulder problem is unique, that every patient is unique and each treatment plan should be tailored exactly towards that particular patient. Um, it's sometimes easy to um, think, well, my friend had XYZ done. Is that going to work equally well for me? And um, as you can see from our discussion, there's not only multiple uh, varieties of rotator cuff tears, but there's multiple different types of treatments for each. And a lot of it is extraordinarily subjective and dependent on the patient's goals, their subjective feelings about uh, what they want out of their uh, function of their arm, how much pain they're in, how much dysfunction they're having. So ultimately, I think it boils down to that. It boils down to the discussion between the doctor and the patient and then working together to tailor the best plan uh, for that particular individual. Um, I have patients who, if you looked at based just on their MRIs and X-rays, are treated completely differently from a patient that might have the exact same findings because uh, of personal reasons or for other reasons such as um, medical reasons. So um, assessing uh, a patient's risk tolerance or, or uh, laying out a, a, a plan and what patients are to expect for a uh, long-term strategy is really important um, to get the best outcome overall. Well, I think that's excellent advice, and I, I hope to, to be able to discuss some of these procedures in more detail uh, in later discussions with you. So I want to thank you for joining us today and look forward to, to future discussions with a little more detail in some of these uh, fairly complex procedures that we've talked, to, talked about today. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Randall. I enjoyed it as well.